Our merch store is back. Go to eeriecast.store to shop our small but growing collection of shirts, featuring EerieCast and Freaky Folklore. A Darkness Prevails shirt and a Wendigo coffee mug are coming soon. Each purchase supports our shows. Thank you. If you hike alone on a wooded trail, you've already made a grave mistake. If those dark and terrible things that lurk in the shadows take notice of you, they'll see you only as an easy meal. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails to see a gnarly and terrifying picture of a 13-foot crocodile with a massive bite taken out of it by something even bigger. Very weird. Today I've got a random assortment of stories featuring terror in the mountains, scares on the trails, and more. Enjoy! And don't forget to send me your scary stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. I'm looking for trucker stories especially. Also, go to eeriecast.com for more free podcasts like this. Now, let's begin. Never Hike the Appalachian Trail Alone From B. Morrison Growing up, my thing had always been walking alone in the woods. I was a creative writer in school. My attention span now is far too gone to finish much writing these days. But back then, I would take a stroll through the woods to get my writing done. Just me, a pencil, and a notebook. Heck, sometimes I'd even listen to Silent Hill and Parasite Eve OSTs. Some of those tracks were pretty creepy too. Yet it never creeped me out. Being alone in the woods listening to music that could be eerie, I never did feel afraid. This single experience, however, has left me with a feeling of dread at the mere thought of going back in the woods alone. I still venture out there, but that peace of mind I used to have just isn't there anymore. I work at a call center. I have weekends off and I was single at the time, with not too many friends. I would frequently spend my weekends hiking and camping along the Appalachian Trail. I lived only two hours from it, and the drive itself was usually quite relaxing too. Solo hiking and camping can be difficult, and it's not something I recommend for inexperienced hikers. Even if you follow a forecast, weather can turn unexpectedly. The rare large animal encounter can happen, and sometimes you can put yourself in a very dangerous situation when you've got no one with you. I sprained my ankle once on a trail in the nearby mountains. I was miles deep, and having gone in alone, I had to trek back, limping all the way. Not a fun experience. On a cloudy Saturday morning, I woke up early, gathering my things and venturing forth to the Appalachian Trail. A couple of hours of a drive there, I arrived. No rain at all just yet, though the sky would remain overcast for the duration of my journey. I'd planned on a one-night camping trip. I wouldn't go too deep. I had some plans the following day for my sister's baby shower, and I didn't plan on missing it. The hike in was smooth. The air that day was just the right pressure and humidity. It was an especially comfortable hike. I never would have expected what would soon transpire. I hunkered down under a poplar tree, chowing down on a cliff bar. Then I finished off my first bottle of water. I looked around as I enjoyed my brunch, trying to remember the names to the numerous different trees and shrubs around me. Then I thought about a meeting I'd have to come in early for on Tuesday. It was around then I saw something that made my heart lurch. A human figure at the top of a dead tree about 20 yards to my right. It was small. I could very clearly make out a small coat, pants, shoes, and hair. What in the world? I wondered. My heart raced as I picked myself up and ran over towards the tree. Surely I wasn't seeing a child stuck at the very tip top of a tree in the Appalachian Trail, right? It was the most bizarre thing. I definitely panicked, to be honest. If this child fell from that height, they could be hurt, if they weren't already. I mean, the figure wasn't moving at all, except for their clothes blowing in the wind. Hey, are you okay? I called up. 
No response. No movement either. I gulped, my heart sinking a little farther. Now, you're probably thinking I should have called for help then, but I had a habit of leaving my phone in the car. I don't like looking at my screen too often, so on short hikes, I like to leave it behind. I was only going to be out overnight, so I thought I wouldn't need it. I made a quick decision, and I began to climb. I was in decent shape, sure, but I hadn't climbed a tree since I was what, 12 or 13 years old? Luckily, this tree was nearly perfect for climbing, branches all in the right places. It was only recently dead, too, so none of it felt brittle yet. I had to stop several times, but eventually, exhausted, I made it close enough to the figure to reach out and touch their shoe. I poked the bottom of one of their shoes, trying to get their attention or get a response. The shoe fell the moment my finger touched it. Underneath, there was no sock, no foot. I looked closer at the rest of the figure. There was no person inside the clothes. The coat and pants were empty, and the hair... Well, that was especially weird. I reached up, nearly losing my hold on the tree, and inside the hood of the coat was in fact very real human hair. Long and straight, like it belonged to a young girl. But the strand I pulled wasn't attached to anything. Oddly enough, I could see flakes of skin on the end of the strands, as if the hair had been yanked from someone's head. I felt vomit rising from my stomach. Before I could react further, I heard something below me then. Footsteps, slow and heavy. Then there was a whisper just barely louder than the wind. Come down. The voice sounded feminine and elderly, but somehow it sounded closer to me, as if the speaker was on a nearby branch. Impossible. I was the only one up here. Come down now. It repeated without any change in its inflection. Obviously, that was the last thing I wanted to do. I stayed in that tree, clinging for dear life. But my muscles were getting wary, my limbs wobbly. Come down now. It came again suddenly after about ten minutes of silence. I was at my limit then. I tried resting myself on the branch below me, but it was thin, forcing me to press my feet and legs forward onto it to keep my back steadily against the trunk. There was no position in which I could rest. I had to get down. Come down now. Again, I heard the whisper. The footsteps came again too. They seemed to be just below me at the bottom of the tree. But when I looked... I saw no one. I climbed down to the next branch, my legs still wobbling. Then the next, then another. Until at last I was confident I could jump down without being hurt. I took a deep breath. I remember thinking, go, and jumping at the same time. I hit the ground, both my knees popping, but I was fine, and I ran as quickly as I could down the trail the way I came. I didn't look back. I have no idea how I was allowed to leave. Whatever I had encountered out there felt so malevolent, evil, but I ran until I saw another person whose expression was one of confusion and startlement. I smiled, panted, and continued past. Back at my car, I called the ranger station with my phone, which had been waiting on me in the glove compartment. I reported what I'd found and where I found it. I couldn't help but think then, maybe I should have run instead of climbing that tree. But the idea of the poor child falling from it while I was gone, trying to find them help, ate at me. Now knowing there was no child, I felt as if I had been baited. Some subconscious part of me was telling me something had laid a trap for me. Then again, why was I allowed to leave? That was the last of it. I never heard back from anyone regarding the encounter. I've never heard of a similar experience, and I've seen no news reports about a missing child. In the end, a fear of the woods now lingers with me.
and I'll be staying far away from the Appalachian Trail for the time being. My Brother and the Thing From Romeo Chick 94 There were many different creepy things that occurred around my little brother. His nickname was Time. Let's start off by first stating our mother was very cruel. If you've ever read or heard of a book called A Child Called It, that pretty much sums up how our mother treated us. She had eight kids, but for some reason, she only treated Time and myself like garbage. Probably because we share the same dad, while the others had a different dad. At a very early age, Time would panic every time the sun started to go down. We used to have to stay in the unfinished garage. No windows, no AC, no heat. We shared a bunk bed with very crappy mattresses. Time is four years younger than myself, and he was very terrified of the dark. One night, my mother had locked us in the garage for the next three or four days. She was upset because I stole food from the kitchen to feed Time and me, since she didn't allow us to eat with the rest of the family. I stole those zebra cake snack cakes. She hadn't fed us in a couple of days, and we were starving. We normally had a bucket to use the bathroom in, and a gallon jug of water, and that was it. That night, I heard Time sniffling as Mom locked the door on us. I jumped down from the top bunk to look at him. Are you okay? It's only for a couple of days. I I'm sorry. I shouldn't have taken those snack cakes, I said softly. He just shook his head. He didn't really talk much. Mostly, he spoke in broken sign language. He made the sign for a cookie, which threw me off but I hopped up into my bunk and grabbed the two Oreos I had for him every night. I'd stolen a pack a while back, and they were getting stale now, but I always made sure he had some. I handed the two to him, and he smiled. He always took his time when he ate them. I went over to hop back into bed, but I noticed him staring at the garage door. What is it? I asked. His eyes widened, and he shook his head. No, he whimpered. Then he made the sign for scared. I walked back over and hugged him. It's okay, I'm not going to let mom hurt you, I promised. I always made sure to make her more mad at me so she didn't hurt him. No, he said. Then he made the sign for monster. I blinked a few times and replied, there's no monsters, remember? No such thing. Yoshi cleared them all out. You see, Time loved Yoshi from the Mario games. Every time he got scared, I told him that Yoshi himself would protect him. It worked for almost everything. But just then, something smacked hard against the garage door, making us both jump. No, yelled Time. It's back. It was probably just a bird. Birds get confused when it gets dark out, I told him. It did happen often. Normally, it was the window in the living room, but they could easily hit the garage door as well. Time shook his head. No, it comes at night, every night. He was starting to scare me, too. What was he talking about? I lay down on the floor next to his bunk. Okay, I'll sleep right here so nothing can get you. He threw a pillow down to me which brought a smile to my face. We were always there for each other. I reached over and turned off the dying lamp that sat on the floor. It barely had light to it, but it was better than nothing at all. Pretty soon I could hear time whimpering again. I grabbed our emergency flashlight which I hid under his bunk, and I turned it on. It was dim normally, but if clicked twice, it had a bright strip of light down the side to light up the whole garage. I sat it on the floor, sitting up so the whole room glowed. A shiver ran down my spine. Why is it so cold tonight? It's July, I asked, 
pulling my quilt down from the top bunk. I glanced at Time, who was now focused on the far corner of the garage. What is it? But I was cut off by a loud boom. Seconds later, from the direction of the door, our mother called down. Quiet down there, was basically what she said. That boom had not come from my mother's direction, so it wasn't her. Now I was frightened. There was no way it could have been a bird either. Hungry, Time said, sitting straight up in his bunk. I know, buddy. I'll get us some food once mom takes her sleepy meds. No, he's hungry. This stopped me dead. Who? Was all that came out. Time stared at the garage door. He wants in. This panicked me. Never had I felt so scared before. I hopped up and shone the light over to the garage. Nothing was in the room with us, but I could see something moving around by the crack of the door. Then another boom. It tried to open the door. That's why I could see out of the door now. The metal lock had stopped it, but the door was old and the lock was old too. It was coming undone. This didn't look good. I thought it was probably a homeless man trying to get in. I looked back at my little brother and put my finger to my lips. He nodded and understanding. I pulled a little pocket knife my dad had given me out. If he stuck his fingers through the door crack, I was going to cut him. My heart pounded in my ears, but I knew if I told our mother, she would just punish us worse, calling us liars. I really didn't even think about telling her at the time. Then, I heard this weird screeching noise as I edged closer to the door. A lump stuck in my throat. What can make a sound like that? A raccoon? That idea made me feel a bit better, but something in my gut said whatever was on the other side was dangerous. I looked over to the log. I noticed a roll of duct tape next to it. That could help. Quickly and quietly, I pulled a piece of duct tape from it. It was way louder than I expected it to be. I froze as I heard whatever was on the other side run or hop to the other end of the door. Had I scared it? I ripped more duct tape off, sticking it around the lock. I'm not sure if it would help at all, but it did make me feel a bit better. Then, what sounded like nails on a chalkboard rang out. This lasted for what felt like ages, but was probably less than a minute. Time squeaked, but buried his head in the blanket to stifle it. I ran back over to my brother, and I hopped into the bunk with him. What was that? I said as softly as I could. Time grabbed the flashlight and turned it off. Monster, he said. Why'd you turn the light off? I asked, a bit alarmed. He shrugged. He don't like it, he replied. Then he signed, angry. I didn't know what to think. How do you know that? I asked. He didn't answer for a while, but soon he said to me, talks to me every night. This really freaked me out. What does he say to you? Time fumbled with the flashlight. Once in, he finally said. Then he pointed to himself. At first I thought he meant inside the garage, but then it hit me. Is it a demon or a ghost? I asked, my body shaking all over. He shrugged and simply said, Monster. A monster wanted my brother. These words echoed through my head. Curiosity took hold of me. Have you seen it? What does it look like? He turned the flashlight on dim so I could see him better. He signed, Scary, Tall. Nasty. We really didn't know sign language entirely, so a lot of what he signed was broken. There was no way this was happening. Bang, bang, it hit the garage again. 
I was hoping mom had taken her sleep meds and passed out already, or we'd be in bigger trouble if we survived this. Time grabbed my arm, and I looked back at him. He whimpered. In? Monster? Trying? I didn't know what to do, so we just sat there, hoping it wouldn't get in. I must have passed out, because when I opened my eyes, light was starting to poke in through the garage door. Time was still asleep. I softly got out of bed and went to the door to the house. I used my pocket knife to slip the lock open and peeked out. It was still very early. Everyone was still asleep, and our stepdad must already be at work. I crept out and went straight for the front door first. I held my breath as I slowly opened the door and peered out. Nothing was there. I closed the door behind me as I walked over to the garage. There were a bunch of dents in the door, and now I knew why. Tears ran down my face. It was real. That wasn't even the worst of it. On the ground next to the door were huge footprints. These looked like dinosaur footprints. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Four-toed, giant, dinosaur-like footprints. What even was I looking at, I wondered. I had never seen anything like it. I remembered from Jurassic Park how the T-Rex's prints were, and these reminded me of that. Not exact, but it was the closest thing I could think of. There's no way a dinosaur just tried to get into our garage, though, right? I shook my head at the idea. This wasn't possible. The strange sounds it made, how it talked to time, this was something way strange. I quickly went back inside and into the kitchen, stealing some food that wouldn't be missed like I always had to do. I would take baggies and fill them with cereal, cookies, or whatever was open that wouldn't be noticeable. Then I ran back to the garage. Putting the lock back was the trickier part, but within minutes I had gotten it. I woke up time and gave him some food. He smiled and ate happily. After a few minutes, he asked me, Monster, gone? I nodded. Yes, it went away. How many times has it been here? I asked. All those dents weren't from last night alone. There was no way. He paused a moment, swallowed his food, and held up his hand, showing me five fingers. Five times? In a row, or... He held up three fingers. Last night makes three in a row. A shiver ran down my spine. What was this thing? And why did it want my brother? The Smiling Face Through the Window From Suncatcher This happened to me only a few nights ago. I live in a town that doesn't have much happen in it at all. You'll hear a news story here and there about someone robbing the local Walmart, but that's about it. You don't have to worry about break-ins or murders. My point is, it's a safe town, where anything scary or even paranormal is unheard of. That was until what happened to me recently. I was heading home from work after a very long shift, I worked the night shift, so I got back home at almost 2 a.m. It was pitch blackout, with no one else on the roads. My home is a duplex that fits two units, the upstairs and the downstairs units. I live in the upstairs one, which means I need to go behind the house where a door is that contains a separate set of stairs leading right up to my door. After months of being lazy, I just started driving my car behind the house, which created a flat patch of grass I called my parking spot. The house was in a hidden residential area with zero street lamps lighting up the road, so the only thing allowing me to see would be my front headlights. That night I pulled in and put my car into park. I turned myself towards my side passenger seat. I began gathering my things, my purse, my lunchbox. As I turned back to open my door... I froze. A few feet away from me, 
I could make out what I swear was a face. I couldn't tell if it was standing or crouching, but its head only stood as tall as my window. The face was paper white with black round eyes. There were no ears or mouth on the face at all. The most terrifying part about it was its smile. Long, sharp yellow teeth with weird pieces of brown in it. I stared, completely frozen, with my hand still hovering over the handle of my car door. Seconds that felt more like minutes passed by until finally the face just disappeared. I mean, it completely vanished in under a second. I couldn't see anything inside the blanket of darkness all around me, beside what my headlights illuminated in front of me. I chalked it up to my brain playing tricks on me from being so tired. I wish that was the truth, though. Quick rustling sounds from the overgrown plants beside me caused my head to snap in that direction. The figure dashed past my car and towards the direction of the door I needed to get to. It was so fast, yet I caught every detail I wish I never knew. It was small like a child, but looked nothing like one. All of its skin was inhumanly white. It looked severely malnourished with how much its bones were sticking out. It moved like an animal on all fours. I slowly pressed my back against my seat, just staring at where it had disappeared into, outside of where my headlights could reach. I couldn't even hear my own heavy breathing and barely contained sobs. I had never felt this way before, that paralyzing fear and pounding of my own heart. I was trapped. No one else was awake at the time. No one would answer their phones if I called them. No one would notice I'm still in my car with their blinds closed. I contemplated everything. Should I take a chance and run for my door? Should I turn my phone's flashlight on to see if it's still there? Should I honk my horn until my downstairs neighbor comes outside to investigate? No, every scenario I felt like it was waiting for. It was waiting for me to make a move, to step outside the only protection I have against it. So I waited. Hours passed without me seeing it, but I didn't dare move or leave. After what felt like ages, the sun slowly started to rise. Once I could see everything around me, I observed all of it. The trees, the grass, my still closed door. It had to be gone now. It was so quiet, and there were few places it could hide without me seeing it stand out. Still, I didn't get out of my car. Not until I heard a few cars driving by on the road. That would mean some people were awake, going to their own work shifts. I bolted out, ran through the door and up the stairs. Turns out I was so loud with my running and slamming the door behind me, I scared my neighbor awake. I haven't told anyone what I saw. No one would believe me. They'd say I was so tired I probably hallucinated it, or it was just a stray dog running past. For the last few nights, I have not gone back after work. I drive to my parents, who live an hour away, and come back only when it's fully light out. Once my lease is up, I'll be leaving right away. I have no idea if it'll ever come back. The scariest part about the whole thing is that when I park my car, my door is automatically unlocked. The entire time it could have possibly opened any of my doors and gotten in. Whatever it was, a skinwalker, the rake, I hope to never encounter it again. Haunted Childhood Home from Anonymous Between the ages of 7 and 14, I lived in an old home in central Indiana. The house was one of the oldest there with it being over 100 years old. I never felt right in this house. Between the phantom steps on the stairs, the radio turning on by itself, and even a bench lifting on its own, I didn't have a lot of room to feel comfortable. 
this experience happened to my dad. The basement door to the house was in the kitchen, and when sitting in the middle room, you could see the kitchen. One morning, he was getting ready for work. He had bent over to tie his shoe when he got a weird feeling. He said it felt as if he needed to look into the kitchen. Just as he did, he saw this cloaked figure walk from the basement door across the entire kitchen. This second encounter happened to me. Like I said, I never felt easy in this house, and I would never sleep. So most nights I would lay awake, waiting for my dad to get up for work. When he did, I finally felt safe enough to fall asleep. One such night I was wide awake in the living room, watching TV. Out of nowhere I got that uneasy feeling. I looked over towards the living room door, and I saw something that scared me. A translucent figure with what appeared to be a square head. It kept peering from around the door frame and staring at me. The door was the only way out of the living room, so whatever it was, it had me trapped. I just covered my head with a blanket and prayed it would go away. Eventually, it did. Haunted University from Alex N.C. I graduated from this university about a year ago, but I still remember this event very vividly. If no one believes this, it's okay. I'm Wiccan and have also always been trying to gain a better understanding of the paranormal. I do know some students on that campus believe this story, as well as a girl who was my roommate at the time. Well, I was a freshman that year, and I had just moved into the freshman dorms. There were various freshman dorms, but mine was on the farthest side of the campus, and was one of the oldest dorms on the campus. In the dorm building, they have a girl's side and a boy's side. Both have showrooms of what the rooms look like for students who are interested in attending school there. Apparently in the girl's showroom, a student once died. I always thought it was kind of chilling, but I didn't think much beyond that. A few months into living in my room, my roommate and I experienced something we cannot explain. Originally, our beds weren't bunked, but we made them that way. My bed was on top and hers on the bottom. We were both in our beds at the time, watching TV. We always kept our door locked, especially at night. Suddenly, our door opened slowly at first. Then, all at once, it fully swung open. We could see right into our hallway then. My roommate and I looked at each other with shock, because how could the door have opened like that from the outside without a key to our room? We shut and locked the door again. We went to bed, although I don't think either of us really slept that night. I knew I always felt uneasy about our dorm, and whenever I had to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, it was even more unsettling. At night, there is a single light in the center of the hallway, where the door to the girls' bathroom slash showers are at. Otherwise, there is no light in the hallway, except for the red exit signs. I always tried to make my trips quick, because I got the feeling something was watching me from the dark corners of the hallway, and I never ever stared into the large bathroom mirror because I felt that, if I had, I was going to see something or someone. Eventually, my roommate and I learned we lived right above the showroom where the student had died, and we also began talking to other students who lived in that dorm as well. Some experienced doors rattling and their doors locking and unlocking, or opening and closing, even footsteps by the door. I experienced a lot in college, but I will never forget the unsettling feeling of being watched wherever I went. Campus Ghosts from Cobalt Shard 4 This story happened in 2019 and would continue on until spring of 2021. That's when I graduated from my college. My college has a paranormal investigators club. For the sake of anonymity, I won't say which club or university. 
I had become the president of the club in my freshman year, the spring of 2018. Because I seemed to be really active in the club, as I wanted there to be more events and investigations. After a few investigations both on and off campus, I firmly believed that there was something out there. What it was, I don't know, but my findings were compelling in themselves. Now, the first part of this story starts a little before November 9th, 2019. There was a building on campus that was always spiritually dead, and we used it to train new members. I was a strict club president and modeled my views from Taps in the Ghost Hunter show. I wanted my investigators to, above all else, debunk claims, figure out the rational explanation, and if they were unable to do so, either alone or as a group, then what we captured moved into the category of unexplained. On the night of November 9th, my vice president, a senior member, and a new recruit headed into the building. With them was an EMF detector, which is supposedly able to detect the presence of spiritual or energy anomalies. They also had a broken flashlight, a walkie-talkie to communicate with my group, and an audio recorder used for capturing EVPs. I wasn't with the group at the time, but I learned everything I needed to know from the recording of that night. I myself was with another group in a different building altogether. Their investigation started off as normal, getting base readings of the area that they were in, explaining what they were doing and why to the new recruit, John, and what he should be looking out for. After about an hour of them walking through the entire building, my vice president, Carmen, and our senior member, Dave, elected to sit in the lobby area on the second floor, just next to the elevator. Carmen had the audio recorder. She placed it in front of her. Dave had set up the flashlight, and John had the EMF detector in front of him. They began calling out, asking any potential entities questions, trying to gain any evidence they could, trying to communicate with any entity they could. As I said before, though, it was mostly to show John what kind of questions to ask. Up to that point, the flashlight had been blinking on and off. There was something wrong internally with it, but I was mostly using this as a test to see if John would debunk the flashlight as being broken, rather than it being communication from beyond. While Carmen tried to prompt John into the debunking of the flashlight, she coughed and dropped her phone. Dave then said something faintly, however, listening to the audio gives me chills even today. Briefly on the recording I got back of this happening was the sound of a crying baby. It was louder than the two boys, but quieter than Carmen, so logically it had to be between them. The creepy part was that no one heard it while being there. It only showed up later on the audio recording. There was no way it was one of the investigators, nor was it anyone sneaking around. Security had to let their group in and lock the door behind them as per usual. They were the only three in the building. The story doesn't end there, though. A couple of months after, just after COVID hit the state, we were allowed to go back to this building via special permissions. Only three of us were allowed in because of the pandemic, and so I myself went along with our club advisor, Cassie, and another of our senior members, Autumn. All of us wore masks and remained socially distant as per the rules of the pandemic. I began setting up equipment where the original recording was captured, while the others were talking. Every now and then, the two girls would glance down this really long hallway. I'm talking as long as a football field. Apparently, they had seen something out of the corner of their eyes. Cassie eventually brings this up to me, so I suggest that they tell me what they're seeing separately to see if they are seeing the same thing. Cassie tells me she was seeing a figure that looked like it was twitching and crawling across the floor every now and then, sort of like what the ghost from the grudge did. Autumn tells me that at the very same time, she'd been seeing what looked to be a tall man with a hat. I told them that they are seeing two very different things. I had a full spectrum camera on hand, so I told them I would go down the hallway and place it at the end and see if we couldn't capture these shadows on footage. We continued sitting where we were for hours, asking questions. 
For a long time, nothing happened. Until, down the hallway, it sounded like something or someone was screaming in horrible pain. We ran down there, trying to find whoever was in here. They may be injured or needed medical assistance. In the end, we didn't find anyone. Suddenly, Autumn discovered a door that made a really squeaky noise when opened or closed. She let it swing closed on its own, and it sounded awful. Cassie and I left Autumn at the door with a walkie-talkie while we walked back to where we were. I radioed her to let it swing shut, and the screaming we heard before and the noise this made were identical. We then had to ask the question of how it shut on its own. There was no wind or breeze or anything like that, nor was there anyone else to shut the door in here. The thing had actually swung open on its own somehow. We decided to end our investigation there, packing up everything as we hadn't seemed to communicate with much. We went home, and I began sifting through the evidence with my roommate the next day. What we found still shocks me to see with my own eyes. Just before the screaming door closed, a shadow of something twitchy and crawling seemed to appear briefly, almost as if it was flickering. It crawled in the direction of the door. When it disappeared from the camera was when the door swung shut. From then on, whenever we investigated this building, especially this area, we always got something we couldn't explain on our recording devices or had some pretty strange personal experiences that will live on with us forever. Whatever this thing was, I don't believe it was human, nor do I believe that it liked humans. It always managed to freak my team and I out. It did give us some great stories and various mental scars of which we will have to live with. But I do fear for those who investigate this building in the future without proper preparation, as this field I've seen firsthand can be dangerous. The Beast of Pope County From Salaried Second The town this occurred in was more or less the size of a village. The encounter happened back in mid-October of 2016, as a friend and I were out deer hunting along the ridges north of Hector, Arkansas. We had several cattle deaths before the sighting, but we'd mainly chalked it up to coyotes, or coy dogs, roaming the property, as it was next to the Ozark WMA. This wasn't uncommon. Livestock deaths were expected during the fall, due to the high amount of predators in the area. My friend, Levi, who was like a brother to me, and I had gotten out of classes early, so we rode out to the ridge that we call T-Hill to check my family's cattle and maybe hunt some game that evening, if we saw anything. Usually, the cattle would be grazing and you could spot deer around the fence lines, which bordered the hardwood flats. Everything seemed normal that evening, except the cattle. They weren't in their normal area out on the top of the ridge. Instead, they were hiding in their lower thickets, watching a cow pace around one of the streams that trickled down the ridge. Now, these streams were never over six to seven inches deep, and that was only if we had a downpour. I kept the cow at bay while Levi drove his ATV a little closer to the stream before waving me over. In the stream, there was maybe a two to three month old calf. It was dead, but it hadn't been mauled like it would have been if coyotes had killed it. We were very disappointed. Maybe it was too weak and had drowned in the shallow water of the stream. A few days later, we had the weekend off and went hunting along that ridge. Levi managed to harvest a good-sized deer, and I was helping him drag it out. This is when we saw it. This grayish-colored beast stood up from a bramble thicket in front of us, and it let out a low and deep rumble. Levi was five foot ten, and I'm around six foot two, but this thing still had at least a foot in height over me. Instantly, we both grabbed our rifles and fired at it. The beast stumbled, then screamed. I swear I saw blood bubbling from its chest then. It didn't drop, though. 
Rather, the beast ran screaming through the brush and off through the ridgeline. We're not tracking that dang thing, Levi said as we hurriedly dragged his deer to the trail, then hastily loaded it on the ATV before peeling out of that area. Not long after this, we graduated and I moved away. Levi and I talked about the event several times after, but we always chalked it up to a bear that we spooked. But that's not quite right. I remember the thing having a canine-like face as it rose. And black bears aren't gray. True Freeway Golem Encounter From Ed from Mars Back in 2005, I was living in Los Angeles. I was living a good but busy life. The night of my experience, I was driving on the 710 freeway on my way from downtown LA to Long Beach. It was wintertime, so it was already dark by then, and it was cold. Yes, it can get cold in LA. It was windy, rainy, and a bit foggy too, as I got closer to the ocean. The time was nearly 6pm, more or less, I was driving my brand new car with the lights on, sticking to the fast lane on the left side of the freeway. I was going downhill near a section of the freeway with trees and shrubs on the left. That's when it happened. Out of the bushes, a huge man wearing nothing but trousers came out running and charged straight at my car. In a split second, I turned the wheel to the right and barely avoided hitting what I thought was a crazy bum on drugs. Fortunately, there was no traffic and all the lanes to my right were empty. It happened very fast. I got a good look at the man, and I realized this could not be a normal person. This quote-unquote person was big and was apparently super strong. However, his muscles were not defined. He was bulky instead. He reminded me of the Stretch Armstrong action toy I used to play with as a boy. He must have been around 6 feet tall and 230 pounds. His face wasn't normal either. His features looked crudely carved on his face, as if he was made out of clay or rock and had never been finished, with two empty shallow holes as eyes, a square nose with no nostrils, and a thin line for a mouth. His hair was dirty and looked as if it was completely covered with dirt and dust. The creature had a strange color like a light greenish gray. When the creature realized I was moving to the next lane, it moved quickly and tried to grab my car with his massive hands. As crazy as it sounds, I noticed his hands had no fingernails. They were very square looking and looked extremely smooth as if they were also modeled out of clay. I could hear the squeaky sort of sound of the creature's fingers grabbing my car from the driver's side, but I was going around 60 miles per hour, so it wasn't going to keep a hold of it. Due to the friction, the creature spun clockwise and lost its balance. Through the car mirrors, I could see with horror how the monster fell face down to the concrete as the lights of the upcoming cars could be seen in the distance. There was a curve up ahead, and I was still going downhill, so, soon enough, I lost sight of the whole scene. When I considered it safe, I pulled over to the right side of the freeway. I dialed 911. I told the operator how there was a homeless nude man in the middle of the 710 freeway and gave her the exact location. She asked me for my cell phone number and said she would call back. I was expecting to hear sirens or at least the sounds of cars crashing and honking but nothing happened. Cars passed me by with no signs of disturbance. No screeching sounds could be heard. I couldn't see anything from there, even when I got out of my car and tried to look for any sign of trouble. When the operator called me back, she said there was nothing happening on that freeway, and no reports had been made beyond my own. Confused, I went back into my car and just decided to brush it off as some kind of crazy encounter. I continued my trip. I arrived at my girlfriend's place. She came out of her apartment, hopped in the car, and we went out for dinner. 
I decided against telling her about the incident. We just enjoyed our time for the night. But at one point I noticed the car was low on gas. I found a gas station to fill up at, and when I got out and closed the door, my blood went cold. There were two sets of gray lines marked on the side of my car, going from the front lights all the way to the back tire. The lines were marked in what seemed to be a greenish-gray mud and were still fresh. I trembled, and I asked my girlfriend to come out of the car to take a look. It was only then that I told her the whole story. She looked at the finger lines in disbelief, but she believed everything I told her about this large man that tried to grab hold of my car. The following day, I went to a car wash to get rid of the lines. Sometime later, I forgot about the incident, until I watched this movie. It was about a golem, which is a clay creature brought to life through strange rituals. It was very similar to what I saw on the road. I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I'm sure there is a better explanation, but at the moment I'm convinced that's what I saw that winter night on the freeway. Not Deer in the Pacific Northwest From Nico765 This was a strange encounter I had on a mountain trip with my friend. I've always loved forests, and I love to go on hikes whenever I can. When my friend, Kate, asked me to drive up into the mountains one day, I jumped at the offer. Kate had a usual camping spot where she liked to bring her ATVs, and occasionally she liked to drive through the woods. She and I decided to take two of them down a path that went right alongside the forest with a huge valley on our left. We drove for a few minutes, admiring the view. I'd recently taken up photography as a hobby, so I was wanting to take some pictures of the trip. It was about four or five in the evening, so right around dusk. I was driving along the path when I saw a few deer among the trees. I stopped, hoping to get a nice picture. Kate kept on going, but I shouted at her that I would catch up in a second. I took my camera out of my backpack, dismounted the ATV, and walked a little closer to the group of deer. I stepped on a stick, though, and the deer looked over at me, then ran away. Dang it, I thought. That's fine. There's probably more deer around. Before I turned back, I noticed there was still one deer eating grass in those trees. I crept a little closer, trying not to make any noise. It then whipped its head around, and all of a sudden, I was terrified. Note, I've lived around this area my whole life. I've always known how to deal with animals, and I've practically lived alongside raccoons, hawks, elk, etc., so I had no reason to be scared of this deer. I was about 20 feet away from it, so I wasn't close enough for it to kick me or attack me or anything. But the moment those eyes met mine, I knew something was wrong. This was not a normal deer. The eyes weren't the average soft black eyes of a doe. They were gray, cold, and I swear they were human-like. Then, it growled. It wasn't a canine growl, it sounded more like a person trying to imitate a growl. It was deep and angry, and it rattled me to my core. Its teeth were big and sharp, and by no means the teeth of an herbivore. It was then when I knew I needed to go. I backed up slowly for a few steps, still staring at it straight in the face. Then I turned and I booked it back to the ATV, hopping on, making a beeline in the direction that Kate went. As the wind rushed past me, I gradually heard the birds chirping in the trees. I noticed only then that when I saw that deer, the forest had gone completely silent. I soon caught up to Kate, who motioned for us to take the loop around instead of back the way we came. Eventually, we got back to our campsite, and I thankfully locked myself in the car. 
I didn't tell Kate, her being the most skeptical person I know. When she finished loading the ATVs back into her trailer, we started on our way back home. We drove along the forest pathway, and as we were about to leave the woods, I happened to look back. Two shining gray eyes stared right into my face, and I heard that growl in my ears. I shivered then, blinked, and it was gone. All I saw then was a dark shadow limping its way through the trees. Werewolf in the Fields of the UK From Anonymous I was walking home one night from my friend's house. Must have been around half past ten. I kept to my usual route, straight around the corner, past the shops and up the hill. This would take me home in ten to fifteen minutes. I made my way past the shops, and I began to walk up the hill, past this long stretch of woodland and a field beside it. But for some reason, something felt strange. It was as if something was watching my every move. I could feel the hair prickling at the back of my neck. I laughed it off as nothing, but my own mind scared me. As I looked up, that's when I saw the moon, full and big and bright. Something about it creeped me out, and that's when the scraping noises began. I could hear light tapping, then the occasional heavy thud, like a dog was running or circling around me. I began to run, soon halfway up the hill. I was trying to outrun whatever I was hearing around me, but before long, the uphill run left me fatigued. I was tired and breathing extremely heavily. I listened then, but nothing was there this time, and I mean no noise at all. Even all the birds fell silent, as if some predator was lurking about, and they were aware of it. In an instant, a snarl came from my left, which began more like a hiss, ending in a full growl, like a dog that was ready to bark. Instinctively, I glanced over in the direction of it. I saw a huge, dark figure, it stood at least six and a half feet tall with glowing yellow eyes, eyes that were more cat-like. It stood on hind legs, which seemed most similar to those of a dog, complete with padding and claws. Whatever it was was gripping onto the fence. It looked up at me then. We locked eyes. I tried to back up, but I was shaking, and I soon caught my foot on a rock and fell. By the time I quickly glanced back up towards it, there was nothing. Just a now broken fence and the sound of its feet and hands thumping on the ground as it sprinted in the direction of the opposite field full of cattle. I hurried home. When I got back to my house, I was pale white and I threw up almost instantly due to panic. Before long, that feeling of being watched came back although after a quick glance in the woods outside, there turned out to be nothing there. Or so I thought. An eerie, distant howl erupted from the forest, a howl that sounded more like a scream or a cry. Whatever it was, it sounded angry. Then I spotted them, the same eyes I saw before, now under a tree in the distance, right where the hedges ended. I've never run to my room so fast in my life. This event began to change the way I thought about things. I've never really stepped outside at night much after it. But one thing's for sure. If that was real, what else could be out there? That same paranoia, both from my experience and the question that haunted my mind, still lives with me to this day, almost three years later. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. 
such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.